So we're st we're starting a new topic today, okay? Uh, which is the design of sh for the shaft. So first, I'll use a uh, a PowerPoint uh, to go over some uh, uh, considerations when we design for shaft, okay? And then uh, we'll, mm -hmm. if we've got time, probably today and the next lecture, we'll go over an example, okay? Yeah. So the objective of the learning is to study the key functions of shafts okay, in mechanical design applications and we also want to learn how to create the free body diagram, how to create the moment diagram, and, you know, torque diagram and uh, to find the critical location, to do a stress analysis, right, to for fatigue or static, okay, and then determine a proper shaft size, okay, that's the all you want at the end of the day. So here's the diagram I think I showed you at the beginning of this term. What the? <laughs> so why didn't you guys say so? <laughs> okay. So this is the diagram and I showed you at the beginning of the term. Okay, uh, we are right now at here, right? Oh, yeah. uh, we s we actually where's the gear? The uh, gear is right here, right? So finish that portion of the gear. Okay. So what is the function of the shaft? Okay, uh, it's a rotating mechanical structure okay, for transmitting power and motion. Okay. Uh, there are non-rotating shafts in the old days. Uh, like the application axle in the horse and the buggy sense, okay? Uh, the shaft mainly is used to support a wide range of components. So there are, uh, you can think of anything, gear, uh, sprocket, uh, you know, keys, uh, you know, different kind of uh, machine elements you can uh, use the shaft to carry, right? Okay. It is also structure support load. You know, just you have the radial load, thrust load, or uh, uh, transmitted load, basically like the case from uh, uh, from gear. Okay. Now here's an example. Okay, so this is a basically a shaft uh, carrying a planner and an arbor is a cutting tool. So if you look at this one here, right? Uh, for the question is, what type of stress would you would be important to analyze for this shaft? Okay, so here's a shaft, right? This is the portion that you wanted to analyze, and this is a better. Uh, hmm? Can you? Oh. Come, there's no red color here. Oh, it shows up here. It didn't show up over there. Oh, yeah, it's in the projected view here. No, you're quiet yet. So, it was too automatic. Here's a shot, right? <laughs> 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 so what do you think? What kind of stress, if you want to analyze this portion, what kind of stress do you think it's going to uh, feel for this portion of the shot? You could, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. just saying, you could just raise up the, and use the whiteboard as a thing, so you can use the red to mark it. Mm -hmm. Red board. You lose a lot of resolution. Use the oh, board as a this board? Yeah. Oh, without this one? Yeah. We could use that to draw it instead of... Uh, would that look good? I would, I would do it. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a democracy. <laughs> so, okay, next time maybe I can try. Yeah. No, I'm all concerned is how do I get back to those... Uh, how, how do I get... This is just there in the double screen here. How can I get back to the... Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. There we go. So this is the shaft here, right? Okay, back to the topic. So what type of stress would be important for this one? Shear and torsion. Shear and torsion. So you have a shear force. W with shear force, uh, which, is which location would you think is a shear? Why do you think there's a shear force? Because what? 
the yeah, the weights, the right? Weights, yeah. So you have a sh like a direct shear at this location, right? Because this is rotating, and uh, you probably have a torque, so there's torsional sh uh, shear stress too, right? And uh, chances are there is also bending normal stress, right? Yeah. So that's what we mean in here, okay? So uh, it's actually combined case as we learned, right? So there's combined together here. So how about this one here? So it's a it's a motor uh, motor. There's a shaft, and uh, it's using the belt to drive uh, some other components, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if if very similar to the previous case. Okay, so if you're interested in the, uh, analyzing the, the shaft at this location at here, right? So then, same question: What type of stress would be important to analyze, right? So it's actually the same answer from uh, uh, the same answer as, uh, as the previous question, right? So pretty much the same thing. But this one here, uh, because the shaft here is pretty short, okay? This is pretty short here. If it's a very short, then the direct shear so may not be as as serious as you would. Imagine, okay, yeah, okay. So keep going. What kind of uh, elements the shaft will be able to carry? Right, will be able to carry many. You know, uh, like the first one, transfer power to and from a rotating rotational system. You can have a crank, fan, a wheel, brakes. You can transfer power between rotational system gear. Right, pulley, couplings, okay, or some universal joints or clutches. You can also use uh, as a supporter shaft. So basically, you you can have these uh, bearings on both sides of the shaft, right? Yeah, which is the one of the topic we'll learn how to select a bearing. Uh, you can use it to support the load, like the picture shows. There's a belt in the pulleys, okay, and uh, you may be able to use this this leaf for springs. You can also to use as uh, you you support. Uh, elements that store kinetic energy, for example, a flywheel. Okay, yeah. You can also use to support an elements, uh, for example, like a cam, uh, which uh, actuate a repetitive uh, mechanism. Right. You learned in 381. And you can also use a you can use a shaft to support a seal, which probably protect against the environment. Okay, so all different kind of things. So this is a a diagram here shows you how to locate the elements. So there are different ways of locating elements as you actually to learn. One of the number number one important way to locate elements is use shoulder. So as you can see, there's a shoulder here and here. They're being used to locate this gear and this this gear. Okay? So the shoulder uh, is it's it's good because if you if you want the gear to be exactly this location, you can just create a shoulder at this location. So you can locate that very precisely, right? Yeah. And the other way, <coughs> the other thing is you can, okay, so you, you push it against this shoulder, but you can't let this gear to move along this shaft here, right? So what do we do? How do we prevent then that from happening? And we can use this, this is the one we call the spacer here, okay? So basically to make sure that the gear is not going to move uh, back and forth along the shaft. And the spacer, the other end of the spacer is being uh, pushed against the bearing. And the bearing is being fixed uh, using the housing at here. Okay. On the outside of the bearing, there is this, this one here is a basically a clamp, uh, a clamp, uh, a clamp ring at here. <coughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, same thing at this location here. Okay. For uh, forces not, not too much, you can use this like snap ring. Okay. So, uh, sometimes you can also use a different mechanism. Let's say maybe you can use a set screw at here. You know, uh, if you have a, a little bigger hub, hub, okay, to fix the gear on the shaft. Okay, yeah. You can also have a snap ring location in here. You know, for fixing the gear. Okay. So I'll show you a different ways of locating. But anyway, uh, the common locating elements: cotter, washer, nut washer, sleeve. You know a shoulder, collar, and a screw pin, spacers. Those are common elements for locating elements on the shaft. All right? Yeah. Okay. So this is another diagram here. So for example, uh, this is a sprocket. And to fix that sprocket against the shoulder, they used a clamp and a collar here. Okay. This is very rigid. Okay. Chances are probably there's the big 
uh, high speed or, or, or vibration so you want that kind of rigidity okay and you have a key at here so the key the important thing is is basically if the gear is on the shaft so the gear is supposed to carry by the shaft right when I mean the shaft rotates and the gear will rotate at the same time as the shaft so the torque should be trans transmitted from the shaft to the gear how does that happen and then you use a, a different key at here okay this is a, a wardrobe roof key and then we will learn a different case you know feather case uh, basically square case or rectangular case okay yeah that's also part of design you know to, de to, to design a proper size of the K so that it the, the, the torque or the power can be transmitted uh, properly okay yeah um, right now see this this element the sheave this one is here is being mounted on the outside of this uh, shaft here this actually there's a reason so uh, a lot of the time there's some mechanical component needs a constant maintenance so you, you want it to mount it maybe uh, for ease of maintenance suppose you put this guy inside here and guess what and every time you have to take out take off this bearing and then you can access that element right yeah and taking off the bearing is that sometimes not an easy job because you know once it's there you, know, you want to be there right yeah so that's the reason so anyway uh, you can see the different examples here snap rings right for uh, uh, for locating this okay some other guidelines uh, this is actually good the lecture is basically a lot of things we have learned okay it's more of a just uh, putting them together so this one here is ideas uh, we what we want is we want to design for the shaft so you uh, know in, in, in the common sense is the less basically bending moment the better right because the less bending moment you will have the less what bending normal stress okay but what causes the less bending moment you know bending moment is this is a supporting force times this distance at this location for example right yeah so if this is the same force then the supporting force will be the same suppose okay it's in the middle let's say okay then the only way to reduce that bending moment is actually what to reduce this length okay or in other words to reduce the whole shaft length so that's essentially the guideline here. When you design for a shaft for certain application, right? As short as possible. Okay? Yeah, so that you can reduce this bending moment. Okay? And at the same time, you will have also lower uh, deflection. Okay? Yeah. Not only reduce the bending moment, when you have a shaft, chances are very high probability. You will have mm -hmm. a certain fillet. You will probably have a certain groove. So there's going to be some kind of a geometry discontinuation. And when that happens, then at the location, and guess what? You will have this uh, stress riser or the stress concentration, right? Yeah. So the stress concentration location is important. If, if you put the stress concentration location, let's say you have a, a, a geometry change right at this maximum. So guess what? Your, your stress concentration has a stress riser. And you, they, this location is the maximum bending moment. So you're putting the worst scenario together, basically, right? So if you know this is the location that, that, that has the maximum bending moment, then if we cannot avoid the stress concentration, then we have to put it, right? Or design it such that it's away from the maximum bending moment, okay? Yeah, that's a, uh, a pretty common sense uh, guideline there. Uh, shaft layout, as the picture showed you in the previous one there, okay, uh, it must be specified early in your design process, which is one of the assignments, I think, in the next one. So uh, just draw the layout, okay, of the shaft uh, with, without uh, specifying uh, each portion of the diameter. So layout basically means uh, where do you want the shoulder to be and where do you hmm. want your bearing to be, right? Uh, what type of uh, uh, shaft do you want? Basically, how how stepped it's going to be, right? Yeah. How do you want to carry uh, each one of the components? Okay. So that's basically the early stage thing here. Okay. So once you have it, this one here now. Okay. Then you can perform uh, some kind of free body diagram. You know, based on the layout. So the layout, the other thing is, you, you don't necessarily have to specify the diameter, but you probably will have to specify the length at early stage. So how long do you want your shaft to be? 
Okay, yeah. The length of the shaft depends on you know uh, how, what kind of elements you're carrying. Okay, if you're carrying uh, so many different kind of elements, and then probably it's going to be longer, right? So that kind of things. Okay. Uh, the geometry shaft is generated out of a step cylinder, as we learned. Basically, that's what you want to locate the different elements uh, 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 nicely. Okay. The use of shaft shoulder is an excellent means of actually locating the shaft element and to carry any thrust load. So, if you're using, let's say, a helical gear, then you know that the helical gear will generate a thrust load, right? So, you, when you uh, have a shoulder, you press that uh, uh, helical gear against the shoulder. Now, then the shoulder actually needs to be careful because of whether this side or that side. Because why? Because your, if your thrust load is this way, then you want your thrust load to go to the shoulder first, right? That basically transmit to the shaft now. And then through the shaft to the bearing and to the housing and to the ground. Okay? So that's the, the way here. If you're shorter this way and the thrust load to that way, you know, that's not doing anything, right? Yeah. Okay. For uh, low magnitude of force, shorter can be const constructed uh, with a retaining ring or snap ring groove or clamp on collars. Okay. Uh, axial layout component. In general, okay, it's best to support okay, a load carrying component between bearings rather than cantilever beams outboard of the bearing. Basically, uh, you have a, a so called a straddle mount, okay, so the, uh, the, the elements is sitting basically between the two bearings. Okay? Now, not that you cannot put your elements outside the bearing, so like the, the picture showed you the sprocket to the sheath, right? Yeah, that because you need uh, access it uh, uh, cons cons constantly or frequently, right? Yeah. The reason a lot of time is when you have a cantilever beam, and then you have a, a the deflection. So the deflection uh, for cantilever, given the same amount of the lanes, for cantilever beam, it has a, m a much more deflection than uh, 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 than the same lanes supported by uh, two ends. Okay. And also importantly, it says you you wanted to use only two bearings, okay, for the support, okay. Uh, generally good enough for reasonable lengths of a shaft. If you have a very long lens, you know, very very long, so you probably will have to use multiple uh, bearings support the shaft, okay. But if that's the case, then the most critical thing that you have to bear in mind is this alignment, okay, because we want you the more you have, right. The alignment problem is uh, uh, is more critical, okay. And the selection of the bearing needs to take that into account, okay. The the alignment or deflection of the shaft, okay. So here's a quick example here. So let's say your user is saying, I want you to carry uh, this uh, helical gear, and there's another one here, and uh, uh, with a shaft uh, supported by a two bearing, okay. Yeah. So uh, you can come up with a layout of the shaft, for example, like this, using basically stepped, okay, there are one, two, three, okay, three shoulders, okay, to, uh, 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 to, to locating each one of the elements here, okay. Uh, for this gear, you can use a sleeve at here, okay, to fix that um, basically uh, axially, okay, on the shaft, okay. And for this one, this is a very small helical gear. Okay, it's a very small one here, and a lot, a lot of time, uh, you you probably you don't want to. You, what you can do is you want to design as a so-called integrated pinion and the shaft. So which means what? When you, when you manufacture the shaft, you are also cutting. So basically, you're cutting the pinion and the shaft together. So th this is one whole thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The the reason is because if it's so small, then you know. If your shaft still needs a certain amount of diameter, right? Then guess what? You need to cut a, a fairly big hole on the on this pinion here, right? Then your rim is becoming pretty uh, pretty thick, uh, pretty thin, right? Yeah. So instead, maybe as well just have a in just have an integrated pinion and a shaft structure here. So. You, you basically manufacture everything together. Sometimes, actually, one of the students working with the, in the tech resource sent me a whole bunch of his his work is uh, doing maintenance of uh, 
uh, those uh, big <coughs> uh, transportation trucks, hu huge ones, right? And they have a very <coughs> large, large shaft, uh, you know, f uh, axles in the in the car in the truck. So some of the really big shafts, in the opinion, they actually even that that much a size. Uh, the picture is I see is the it, it's all manufactured as integrated to one piece, okay, right? Yeah. So here's the guideline in case when axle loads are not trivial, okay, it's necessary to provide a mean to transfer the axle load into the shaft, then through uh, bearing to the ground. So that uh, that's a pretty obvious, okay. It's generally best to have only one bearing carry the axle load. So this is actually also important, okay. Uh, the reason is because what it says here, uh, you don't want two bearings to share this axle load, okay? Uh, particularly if you put the two bearings rigidly on the shaft, because the shaft maybe uh, is working under an environment with a at very time varying uh, temperatures, okay? So you will have a literally uh, kind of a so-called thermal expansion of shaft length, right? Yeah. So, uh, for example, for the uh, at here, uh, for this shaft here, there are two bearings. So you will have a thrust load. So there's one bearing here and another bearing here. Okay. So in this case, this bearing, this bearing over here, is the one that's going to take the thrust load, but not this one, because you see this bearing here, okay, actually allows the shaft to, to do what? Do a little bit thermal expansions. Okay, yeah. So suppose if you, you know, happen to put two to share, then if there is a thermal expansion, then there's no way, nowhere for the, for the shaft to, 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 to expand, right? Yeah. So that's the reason in the previous statement there, okay, uh, it's generally best to have only one bearing, one, one bearing carrying the axle load, okay, to allow greater tolerance on the shaft length dimension. Okay, so talking about stress concentration, it's inevitable. Okay, you you will have a sh shoulder, right? And you will have a sharp geometry change. Okay, so you will have stress concentration at that location. But how can we alleviate that stress concentration then? So here's a couple of ways we can do that. You can so-called so cut a so-called uh, stress relief groove. Okay, this is basically a so-called stress relief groove here. Those dashed lines here is kind of a simulation. Those are taken from textbook. Shows you how the stress will flow if there is a stress relief curve uh, uh, groove exist in presence here. Okay. Otherwise, it will be pretty clustered and pretty sharp. Okay. Yeah. So uh, those are the designs that you can uh, think of, think of, or or you can even just simply have a fillet at this location. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Shaft shoulder, okay. Uh, when you design for the shaft shoulder, one thing that you have to bear in mind is your your. Let's say for example, this is a, the location you're you're gonna uh, uh, you're gonna carry a bearing, okay. So you have to take actually the selection of the bearing into consideration. The reason is this: if you look into the bearing catalog, this is a maybe a typical bearing catalog. Uh, the first column is the bearing ball size. Okay, so f it's from here to here, okay, it's the D. And the second uh, is the outer diameter of the bearing, okay. And then here you have a width of the bearing, which is this. And you have this uh, fillet, and this fillet is the fillet at the corner here, okay. See the corner, basically the corner of this uh, bearing ring, okay, the fillet. And uh, then you have the shoulder diameter, basically, what what the DS here is the bearings the catalog says it recommend that the shoulder diameter which is this capital D they call it DS and here it recommend this DS needs to be 12.5 if you pick a ball size of 10 millimeter see what I'm saying right why is that because you see because the shoulder is going to be pushed against this inner ring here, right? Yeah. And guess what? If you don't stick to this recommendation, if you pick a, 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 a capital D other than 12.5, maybe 15 or 17, who knows? So the, the diameter will 
go up, right? And instead of pushing against the inner ring now, so that shoulder actually will be what? Will be pushing against this location, which generally probably it's a, a seal or uh, uh, some kind of cover, right, for the uh, for the bearing. But that's that part is not rotating. The, it's the inner ring is rotating for the bearing. Okay. So, for example, this outer ring is fixed by the housing. The inner ring will rotate, right? So, if your shoulder is being pushed against the top of this location here, you know you'll have lots of pr uh, frictions, you know, against the surface, right? Yeah, which is actually you can damage the bearing basically. Okay. So that's the recommendation you need to stick to. And second, what? Where did it go to the? What did I press? And the other thing is, um, if you uh, focus on this fillet radius here, remember what I said, the fillet radius is the radius of the corner here, right? And the fillet radius is important because you are pushing, pushing this inner ring against the shoulder. So the shoulder, guess what, at this fillet here, the shoulder also has a fillet, right? The shoulder also fillet. So you have a two basic fillet. This the inner the ring the uh, the fillet for the inner ring of the of the uh, bearing and the fillet at this uh, shoulder location. These two fillet need to be compatible, right? Be compatible. So this is a diagram I showed you here. So there are two fillets need to be compatible here, right? If that R A is the bearing corner fillet, and uh, there is another fillet at this shoulder location. So, what would you think? Which fillet should be bigger? The bearing, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you won't be able to properly push the bearing against the shoulder. Okay? Yeah. So that kind of a level of detail when you do design, okay, uh, you might want to keep that in mind. Okay? Even though I might be not be able to go to that detail to identify what's your radius at the shoulder, right? But I think as a designer, uh, you need to take that into consideration. Okay? Yeah. So location in the case, okay, so this is this is a basically a location for a K. And this is another location for a K. Uh, this is probably a location for a gear and that's the location for uh, some other elements, right? Now you need to make sure the location of the case should be along the same reference line, okay? Uh, don't create a case seat, let's say maybe at this location, okay? <coughs> because that will cause maybe unnecessary twist due to the two different locations of the components that you're carrying, okay? Yeah. You should also try to create a chamfer at the end of the shaft so that you can have a, a better or easy easiness in terms of assembly, right? When you put 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 this bearing onto the shaft. Okay? Yeah. So this is little details is important, you know, uh, like uh, one of the uh, application you used to work on, you know, they wrote a robotic uh, to grab a, a while and then put it onto a hole, a plate. You know, the plate that is a whole, whole bunch of holes, right? Yeah. So uh, at the beginning, so it's always the the it's always very hard to precisely put it there if there's a little bit offset. So one of the easy solution is what they create the little chamfer on the top of the hole there. So even if your wire is not exactly perpendicular to the hole, right, you can still slide it into it. Okay. So uh, this is not that critical, uh, but because we don't see that actually in our textbook, <coughs> but uh, I would recommend is doing this. This, uh, if you're carrying a gear, then you probably want the gear length, okay, to be slightly longer than this uh, neck at the shoulder here. So then, when you have uh, the locating elements, for example, a sleeve, okay, and then when you put uh, put it here, it's being put it just, uh, right against the gear, not against the shoulder. You see what I'm saying, right? Okay, because if you're 
uh, tolerance for the gear, for example, is actually here. Okay, if this location, then guess what? Then that sleeve actually not being able to touch that the gear at all, right? Yeah. So uh, giving a little bit of tolerance, okay, positively for to this side, <coughs> is actually good. Okay, one more piece is on the shaft consideration is the low end consideration. So let's say you're designing, okay, this case you have a one input gear, and you have a three output gear. Okay, yeah. So the first guy put the input gear here, three output <coughs> gear at here. Right? Yeah. So then you can draw a torque diagram, right? So the torque diagram is like this. Okay. So this is your proper input torque should equal to the three output torque. Was that right? Yeah. So, guess what? Then, within this location, the, this, mod this, this, p this part of the shaft will feel this amount of input torque, right? Okay, that's probably 200, let's see. But, if the second guy do this, put the input gear at this location, your input torque is still this. So now you look at each portion of the shaft, right? the maximum torque it's not this T1 anymore right yeah so between here is actually T4 plus T3 is much less than this T1 now make sense right so that will basically reduce uh, the torsional stress right on the shaft okay yeah so think about the proper arrangement of the elements though okay yeah okay so having said all of this now so let's take a look at this one here. Okay, this is a some guy designed a shaft. Okay, uh, carrying the gear. Okay, with the two bearings. Okay, uh, this is the housing. This is the cover. Uh, this is the gear. Maybe carry some other kind of elements. Okay, outside the uh, uh, the shaft. Okay, uh, the uh, the housing. Okay. So can you point out some improper locations or improper design? Okay, based on this diagram. Two key slots yeah. aren't lined up. Right? Exactly. So this, right? Yeah. What else? There's temperature. You would be fighting both those bearings. Mm hmm. So how how can we uh, alleviate that problem? What we can do is, we can have a little bit gap at this location. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, maybe a. Uh, some kind of plastic seal, right, to allow a certain uh, flexibility. Okay? Yeah, good point. Yeah? Or you redesign, use a different kind of uh, a bearing, actually. We, we have a non locating bearing, okay, but maybe come to that stage. Okay? So, what else? So this is the cover here, right? This is the basically metal plate. Look at that. That uh, metal plate is is actually what? It's directly touching this shaft. But the shaft is rotating, right? This plate is not going to rotate. So you don't want that happen, isn't it? So you, you don't want this one to touch this shaft, but at the same time, you know you still want to protect the, sh the inner sta space from any outside dust, whatever, right? Seal. Exactly, so there probably should be a, some kind of a mechanism here, right? To put a seal at here, okay? Yeah. Now look at the shoulder here, remember the, the shoulder diameter, right? What, what do we recommend about the shoulder diameter again? And also this piece, this piece is a spacer, right? This spacer. So it's being put it between the gear and uh, the bearing. What do you think the height at here? It's too high, right? Yeah, it's too high. So it's probably better okay, to be lowered and at this location here. Okay? Yeah. <coughs> exactly. So you may want this one here to be slightly right 
into this uh, gear uh, face uh, gear uh, uh, face width. Okay. I can't see that one. What do you What do you mean by that? Uh, uh, basically, e either put this face a bit uh, longer. So leave a little bit of space here. Yeah, yeah. What What else? <coughs> Look at this case. What What's wrong with this case? It. I mean, you, as b beside the one that you just pointed out here, it's too long. It's too long. Exactly. Right. So I think maybe right this location would be good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so. Um, let's look at the solution here. Well, I guess uh, there are a few more things I didn't see, but uh, what else? Oh, oh right. Yeah, uh, well, it's already have a chamfer here, uh, but I but I use a shoulder here. Okay, so create another shoulder so that this piece can be uh, located uh, uh, more uh, precisely on the shoulder on the on the shaft. Okay. Don't the key slots have to be accessible from one side of the. This one. Oh, you can just remove the cover here, right? Put the key, put the key in first. Install the this piece right here, and then install the cover. Yeah. Yeah. After you installed all of the other pieces, right? Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. So this is the assignments that you need in the, in the next assignments when you put on layouts. Okay. Uh, this is something that you need to keep in mind. Uh, in terms of uh, the de this 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 kind of level of details, stress elements. Okay, um, we do design, but we don't have all the dimensions. If I don't have all the dimensions, and then I can't determine what the stress concentration factor is, right? Because you do you need what you need the ratio R over D, you need the ratio capital D over D to give you a KT. Okay? So how do we do that then? Then the design basically means if I don't have those shaft diameter, but what we can do is we, we have to start somewhere, right? So when we start it, we start from a conservative value. If you know there is going to be a stress concentration, so what should I use for the stress concentration factor value? We use a conservative value, okay? So you look at this. Uh, uh, if, if you look at the uh, the diagram here, and particularly actually, if you look at uh, the uh, gear, the this one, the, the catalog, the bearing. So what is the capital? The capital D is a DS, right? A small d is basically the ball size of the bearing. So if you compare this DS and the D, what it, what is the, re the ch uh, typical ratio between these two? It's about what? This is 12.5 divided by 10, 14.5 divided by 12. <coughs> it's about 1.2, right? A little bit above to 1. Point, maybe 1.5 or something like that. Okay. So that's <coughs> typical, basically, a shorter uh, ratio between capital D and a small d. Okay. Yeah. So uh, then, based on this. Uh, based on this uh, stress concentration diagram, and this is a strip for bending moment, so maybe generally what we can do is we can start with this ratio 1.5 and this ratio 0 0.02, and that typically give us a KT about 2.7. So that's pretty high level, a uh, high value already, right? And that's what we call the conservative, okay? Because in the end, you may not ha really have as a 2.7. But you start it with a very conservative value, okay? Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with that, and there's very little chance that it could go wrong. That makes sense? Yeah. So that's the reason here, as you're gonna see, sometimes some in some example, we we'll start with the KT 2.7. Similarly for KTS, the torsional stress, okay? Torsional stress. You can do the similar exercise. You can see that the 2.2 is a relative, okay? Uh, conservative value at here. Okay? Yeah. That's a stress concentration. There's another location that has a stress concentration, which is the K seat. Actually K seat location generally has a much higher stress concentration than a fillet okay, location. 
So uh, this diagram is from uh, Norton's diagram. It's actually taken from a very famous book by Peterson. It's called Stress Concentration Factor. Okay. If you want an electronics version, I'll show you. Uh, it's a book talking about uh, nothing else but stress concentration factor. Okay. Yeah. Here's the diagram shows you here basically. If you pick a ratio R over D 0.02, <coughs> and there are a couple of uh, curve here. Uh, the top two curve is for torsion KTS. This is the curve for KT. Now KTS, there are two different conditions. One it says with K in place. The other says with no K in place. And I think we're going to pick the top one here. Okay, so we will have a K in place. And the corresponding KT and the KTS is this much value, 2.2 and a 3. All right? Yeah. So I don't know what this radius R going to be, but I can start the KT KTS for the K state with this 2.2 and a 3.0. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you start it with a very conservative value. Okay? Yeah. Uh, this is another resource, another source of numbers for KT and KTS. So it separates the case into the cutting tool. Uh, this is a sled runner. This is basically called N milled. Okay? So the cutting tool has a radius, and that basically gives you the radius of the fillet for the case seat. Right? Yeah. Uh, for the different cutting tools, this, this source recommended the key, uh, the stress concentration factor. All right, yeah. Uh, in our table, in our textbook, it's a seven dash one. Okay, seven dash one here. Uh, most example that I cover actually will use uh, this table here for uh, starting value of KT KTS. Okay, for example, if a shoulder shoulder fillet. Using this ratio, ratio R over D, this is recommended bending and torsion, like what I did in the slides. Okay, if it's case state and milled, we can use this. Actually, there's nothing wrong if you use even higher value than this. Okay, if you use three at here, four at here to start with, that's fine. Okay, yeah. Uh, ultimately, once you nail down your final parameters for the design. You probably will go back and recalculate based on all the actual values, right? And you you will actually be pretty confident because you started with a such a conservative set of values. So the final cycle of uh, calculations should end up with what smaller, right? Yeah. So uh, or higher uh, safety factor, basically. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's still a couple minutes here. Um, now I'll quickly go over what you see in the handouts for those uh, uh, shaft design equations here. And I have to say those are not new, okay? Those seem to be new, but these actually are not new. So I'll show you why. Uh, those are shaft, uh, shaft design me methodology, basically, typically very similar. We actually did some of most of this already. You draw the uh, free body diagram, mm -hmm. find the action reaction, uh, find uh, whether you have alternating load or mean or mean or uh, magnitude, right? Uh, based on that, you calculate, you have a bending moment diagram, torque diagram, shear force diagram, find a critical location, okay? Uh, maybe you will consider shaft deflection. Uh, in our design, we'll neglect that. I think in your vibration course, uh, you actually learn some of this, okay? Yeah. So, overall, but anyway, you know, for every different kind of load, whether you have axle load, uh, bending load, or torsional load, they could be static, they could be this so-called fluctuating, right? If you're fluctuating, you will have a mean, you have amplitude. Okay, so those are basically when we talk of fatigue loading, fatigue design, we have to talk about that already, okay? Uh, when you figure out the, the critical location, generally what you look at is the fillet of the shoulder, the case seat, and uh, maybe uh, the fillet at the end, at two ends that are here, okay? Or you need to look at the snap ring location. The, typically, they have a pretty high stress concentration for snap ring. So uh, usually what we recommend is, we, uh, we if you uh, don't use a snap ring right here, you can use a snap ring on the end, at the end of this uh, shaft. Because at the end of the shaft, there's no movement or there's no <coughs> torque. See what I'm saying, right? Because the bending moment diagram only happens between uh, the two ends at here. 
right? So at the at the other end of the shaft, there's no pain and moment. Okay. So once you figure all of this, you can choose a criteria, okay, uh, based on the material property to calculate the safety factor. So this is basically those equations. If you recall that, right, for fatigue loading, there are different uh, design criteria: Soderberg, Goodman, and you know SME yielding lines for the static analysis. Right, so those are equations. The question here is, what will be the sigma a? What will be a sigma m, uh, based on your application? Right. So uh, sigma a, sigma m, as we said, you know, depends on the loading. Okay. Typically, uh, you have probably an alternating bending moment. You have alternating a uh, torque. Okay. Yeah. Actually, in a lot of cases, and for our shaft design, our T a this will be TM. Our TA generally is zero, but TM is not zero. For our shaft design, typically our MM is zero, but MA is not zero. Can you imagine that? So you have a shaft, right? And it's under constant torsion because you're transmitting a constant torque. So that's why TM is not zero, but TA is zero, right? You have a shaft under a constant axial load, uh, radial loading. This force is a constant. The shaft is rotating. It'll generate what? A complete reversed bending moment, right? So MM is zero, but MA is not zero. Okay? So, so that's how you do this. Then you can use the one side stress to find the equivalent sigma A, sigma M, to plug it into the formula that listed there. Solve backward for the diameter. So D is this. So you look at your uh, handout. One of the formula is this. Okay. Was that good? So there are different scenarios for the diameter, basically under different loading conditions. So you can pick one that suits your design uh, purpose. Okay. So we'll take a look at example in the next lecture. Okay, to get on the shaft design. Uh, yeah, so do we have any handouts uh, somewhere? <laughs> that should be a lot. What happened to you guys? <coughs> Will you be posting the PowerPoint? This one? Yeah, okay, yeah. Just for like a file so we can print it off. Or oh, oh, sure, sure. Yeah. I find it, uh, I